Hello, Steve Anderson here with WordCamper News. Welcome back for segment four about the five things you need to be aware of before you buy an RV. Joining us for this presentation is Mr. Terry Cooper, the Texas RV professor, and we're gonna jump right in as Mr. Cooper jumps into number four, which is to help you understand how you need to prepare for you purchase. He's going to delve into helping you understand the various mechanics of being a wise consumer before you purchase that RV. So Mr. Cooper, take it away. Now, four. Before you purchase, you got to do some homework here, folks, and you got to do a little balance your checkbook, so to speak. And let me just tell you, Lady E balances checkbook. We spend our money together. We, on the big purchases, we work together. But by golly, you need to know what's in your checking account or what, how much money you've got available to do what you're gonna do. Know what your limits are on your budget because it's easy to be talked into, well, uh, we'll do, we can increase your monthly, we can increase your monthly payment by $20 and stretch this thing out over another five years. And, and you look at it and you think, how in the world is this thing gonna last 12 years? You know, finance 12 years? all to try to keep this thing within your budget limit. So make common sense here. I mean, think about this. There's going to be the time, and it won't be that far off, that you may want to trade up. And you don't want to be in that proverbial upside-down position. And so you want to be able to have some equity when you get ready to trade with this thing. So kind of like a car. I mean, it's working on the same principle as a car. you got to know what types and features you're looking for. What, are, you know, what do you want this thing to do? Washer dryers? Maybe. Air conditioners? Two? Maybe. Three? So know what you're after. Now, don't get depressed if you're out there looking and you see the new, and it's maybe a little bit higher than you had budgeted for. Don't panic, don't panic. You can buy used. Now, keep in mind on the used market, 60%, now here's a fact that comes from the extended service agreement people, over 60% of the units that are used and are sold are sold from one individual to another. So they're going to like auto trader or, you know, travel trader, um, RV trader, uh, maybe online, Craigslist, uh, Mar Facebook marketplace, go to those places like that and you see it, or you see it parked in a parking lot somewhere. But over 60% of them are bought and sold from one individual to another and it never had a chance to go through a dealership and anybody put eyes on it other than you. And if you're going to be looking at that, you need to come at this with a whole different game plan, totally different game plan, okay? Or if you buy it from a dealer, it's a good deal because, you know, here again, a different price point. Now, Lady E and I have done the Tampa RV show several years in a row. And what used to amaze me is, is that we would be sitting there at the booth working with the, the salesman and if Lady E and I would be talking to customers coming in and they kind of want to know about how things were going. And pretty soon you start developing a relationship with people. And you say, well, I saw you last year and the year before. And they said, what are you doing here? Oh, we're buying another RV. And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You bought an RV last year and you bought it in the spring. So you stayed in it and then you left come summertime. You went back home up north, wherever home is. And then you're now back in here this next year in January, buying another RV. Yeah, yeah, we, we thought we'd come. We like new new floor plans. We like the new smells. We like, and I'm thinking to myself, that RV that they had, it may be a year older, but how much living has it had? Not very much. Those are the units that you want to get your hands on because they're practically new because they haven't really been used because the people turn over and, and same thing with automobiles people turn them over and so you, you what happens is when you go to these dealerships at the rv shows the dealers can't sell these things can't sell used rvs at the dealer show in most states so what happens is they're only selling new but many times if you ask the salesman say hey i like this floor plan i like this and this and this what do you have in use that's been traded in that might be a, a good deal and it's amazing what they've got sitting on their lot. And it might be a several thousand dollars cheaper just because of it had been titled versus it hadn't been titled, okay? Keep your emotions in check. And it's so easy to get wrapped up in the emotion of dreaming of what you, and we forget to see things. We just don't, we don't pay attention to stuff. And we do, guys, sleep on it. Sleep on it. It's amazing how the adrenaline rush of the emotion dies down when you t when you go to bed. 
and you wake up the next morning, if you still have that urge, then go back and take a serious look at it again. And I will tell you, if you're one of those individuals that makes snap decisions like that, and I'm one of those, I'll research, 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 but when I'm ready to buy, by golly, I'm ready to buy. I have to hold myself in check. And what I find many times is that if you're the same way, get you an RV inspection. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But there are actually individuals that have been trained. And right now, I'm serving as the president of the RV Inspectors Association. I mean, I, I really see it. I believe it. I understand how it works. It's a home inspection for an RV. These are the people you want to get to get involved, okay? I mean, it all started out, I had a banker call me. And this banker called me and he said, Cooper, he said, I don't understand. He said, you know, if this was a home or a boat, I could require an inspection. But an RV, who can do an inspection for me? He said, I've got this woman that's in my office, want, to, want me to finance a motorhome for her. And she's going to take this motorhome and travel across the country, and visit her sister on the West Coast. And they're going to take a tour of all the wineries on the West Coast. I mean, because she hasn't seen her sister in years and years and years. And she's wanting to buy this RV. And he said, I'm sitting here talking to her. Ask her, well, tell me about, the, tell me about this motorhome you have. And he said she talks about all the features, the bells, the floor, floor planning, all that stuff. And he said, I kept trying to get her back. Well, what brand is it? What model number? Do you have a VIN number on this thing? Tell me about it. And he said, all this woman can tell me is she just loves the color of the curtains. She loves the floor plan, how it's laid out. Well, folks, we're all that way. Once we fall in love with something, that's all we see. So we got to get the emotions out of the way so we make a good logical decision on this. We can feel good about it after we buy it as long as we've got the logic because it could be like me buying those shoes. I bought them on emotion because I thought they were great looking shoes and they were exotic skins. But by golly, when I got it, got them home, it was a different story. And we don't want that to happen to you. Take your tools with you. Stick you a measuring tape in your purse. Take you a box of Cheerios. Doesn't have to have Cheerios in it. Fold it up. And then when you get there and to, want to start checking things out in the kitchen, you're going to want to you look at that empty pork and bean can or the green bean can or the Cheerios. It can be raisin bran, whatever. But take that box and check the shelving. Lady E has taught me this. She said, I'd look at it, I'd open it up and say, oh, man, that's a great looking cabinet. She'd look at it, no, uh-uh. I'd think, why? What's wrong with it? She said, well, let me show you. Pulls her, and she used um, raisin bran. So she takes her raisin bran box out, sticks it in there, and it won't fit between the shelves. You have to lay the raisin bran box down. She said, now, how, how convenient is that going to be? She said, we're going to forget to put the chip clip on the, the bag, and we're going to be dumping cereal all in the, in the cabinets, or we're going to have to get to these, all these Tupperware-type bowls and put cereal in it. And she said, I know how you're going to be. That's not going to work for you. I said, okay, that works for me. So tell, teach me something else. Tell me about the can. I said, look at this over here. It has some gorgeous cabinets. The doors are great. She said, yeah, okay. She opened them up. She said, look at how narrow those shelves are. Couldn't even put the can on the shelf and close the door. She said, it's a good spice rack, but why in the world do I need four feet of spice rack? She said, I, I can do better than this. And she said, so we kept looking. So these keep you from making a mistake, okay? Because you're going to know what things you're going to have. You're, if you have that favorite soup ladle or you know, cutting ware or knives and forks, or maybe you bought some of that cookware, that waterless cookware, these are things you've got to take a look at. Your stuff needs to get in, be able to put in this RV. They look great when the unit's empty, but not so much when you start putting things in the pantries. So that measuring tape, that box of cereal, and that, that can will make all the difference to help you make sure. Take a serious look, and this is something we've learned the hard way. Take a serious look about these when you pull out the drawer and it's got the places for the knives, forks, and so on. Take a look and just see. Chances are you're not going to be able to get your knives in there, your soup spoons. They just didn't make plans for it. And you can find out real quick some of these kitchens that are chef and cook friendly and which ones are just decorative, make them look good. And obviously that's one of those deal breakers as far as it is around our house. Now, remember now, if you buy use, here's some tidbits I want to pass on to you. Please, please pay attention to this because it'll save you money. I promise you. I've seen it over and over again. If you buy a unit that's over 10 years old, you may have problems getting financing on that unit if you decide to do that. And so you may be forced to go to a credit union, and sometimes they're a point or two above what you might be able to get through the, the dealerships. 
But just remember, sometimes anything over 10 years old may have some problems getting the financing. Also, there's some RV parks out there, particularly, and this is going to be a big thing for you if you're going to be work camping. They're, they may ask you to send you or send them a picture of your rig. And you think, excuse me? Yeah. I mean, we've there's some of these parks are very exclusive. And they put a limit on what that thing looks like. And even if it's a newer one, sometimes they may even ask you for that picture. I've seen ads that people say, you know, send us a picture of you and your RV. They're looking for a certain profile. And I know that sounds discriminatory, but you know what? It's their RV park. They can call it in the way they want to if it's privately owned. Now, if it's a state or federal park, they can't do that. But there's plenty of other parks out there that can be very restrictive. And don't put yourself in in trouble if you buy a unit that's a little bit older and you may run into this situation. Get that RV inspection. I promise you the inspections are not expensive at all and what you will save of what they find will more than pay for the inspections. I can guarantee it. When you got an air conditioner cost $1,200 and they found it with an inspection that was less than six, Guess who's ahead on that deal? Because if the if the air conditioner's conked out, more than likely you're going to be able to sit down with that seller and say, "Look, here's the inspection report. And these are the things we've had. I need to have either one of these fixed, or we need to work on the price point of this." So it gives you more bargaining power. Now, if you're running motorized, now this is critical. If you're running motorized, because here you want to get the fluid analysis. You want to get the blood test on the engine oil, the engine coolant, the transmission fluid, the rear end. If you've got um, if you've got a generator, get the oil checked on it. And we're talking typically less than 300, 350 bucks to get those done. And what they do is they pull samples. The hardest thing about these is they've got to send them in the mail and it, you know, mail time takes a little while, and typically they can turn that report around once they get it. They can turn around within 24 to 48 hours, and then you get an electronic version of it. But here's the thing. We've been tracking this thing for the last five years, and I got the stats the other day. And I was looking at motorized because I'm really kind of curious about the transmissions and the engines because that's such a high-ticket item. 18% of the fluid samples that were pulled on the motorized units – on the engines, the engine oil, 18% had some sort of issue. Now, of that 18, 15% of it may have not been catastrophic, but they were going to have to have some work done. Maybe the fuel injectors need to be cleaned, or maybe had a fuel injector that was sticking, so it was going to take a repair. Not a big repair, but it was going to take some time. Because if that fuel injector is hanging open, it's spraying that diesel or that gasoline in there, and it's actually diluting the oil viscosity. But there's 3% of those motorized units, the engines were literally coming apart. Now, I, I'm saying this to say, guys, put the brakes on, pay attention, because if you do not get fluid analysis, you don't know what's going inside that engine. I mean, can you imagine buying a unit, maybe you spend $150,000, $200,000 on this thing, and you didn't get the fluid analysis, then you find out maybe the transmission's gone down. And those Allison transmissions are not cheap to rebuild. If you've got one of the gasoline uh, units, the engine and the transmissions are not cheap. And we've got some friends here, that they just dropped 3500 bucks on reworking that transmission on that Class A gasoline motor, our motor home that they have. It wasn't in their budget, but here's the thing about it. Why do you want to buy somebody else's problems? And the fluid analysis will tell you what you need to know so the way you can step around it. Now, I, I will tell you, and, and I specifically asked for, the, uh, for them to pull the numbers in a format with the engines for the Class Cs and the Class A motorhomes, the gasoline and the, uh, you know, the Class A motorhomes and Class Cs, and particularly with the gasoline engines in them. I wanted to know about the transmission. Right now, the two manufacturers, the chassis manufacturers, are Ford and then Chrysler with their Ram. The Rams haven't been there long enough for us to really get a good, get a good tally of them. But I will tell you, the Ford right now, we're having to really watch the transmissions because what we're finding is people are hooking a full-size pickup or a big old trailer in the back of that Class C. So now that transmission is really struggling up and down those mountains. And guess what it does to that transmission fluid? Guess what it does to those pads and, and all of those things that are going on inside that transmission?
So if someone's not paying attention, they buy this thing and next thing you know, they're gonna be dropping a $3,500 transmission repair or replacing that thing. And so we were watching the fluid analysis and I was amazed at the numbers. And you could just go down the list and just see, you know, that when that's, when that results come back and it's marked orange or red, it's like pay attention to this because it's gonna cost you money. Now look at getting extended service agreements, but also make sure with that extended service agreement that you get roadside assistance. It's not much fun sitting on the side of the road hoping that somebody will come get you. But if you got that roadside assistance, it's kind of like calling that brother-in-law. He may not want to come, but by golly, he'll be there at two o'clock in the morning if that's what it takes. And that's what those extended service agreements are there for that had the roadside assistance. Uh, lady and I have been towed in twice on a hook. Let me just tell you, it sure is nice to see that big old truck pull up. And they, hook, they hooked onto that one ton truck. He disconnected the drive shaft and we're still having the fifth wheel hooked onto the truck. And he said, climb in the cab. And that truck didn't, it belts a little smoke when you put it in gear, off we went. And what he did is he dropped the rig off at an RV park and then he took the truck over to the repair, one of the, the dealership to get repaired, to get some things taken care of on it. Now, keep in mind, this extended service agreement is not an extended factory warranty. Never let anybody tell you that. The only people that can extend your factory warranty is the factory. And typically the only time they do that is there, if there had been something going on with that unit and they wanted to show good faith that they believed in the repair that they took and they did for you. I've seen them extend warranties 90 days, 120 days, you know, six months, the most I've ever seen is nine months that they extended it out. But long and short of it, only the factory can cover everything. Extended service agreements are nothing more than there's very specific things that they're gonna cover, engines, transmissions, and there's even some of those things. And they'll, they'll spell it out for you what they won't cover. So there's different brands, there's different types, search it out a little bit because there are some things there that will work for you. Because if you're out on the road, you don't need the surprises but you need somebody on your side. And, and let me just tell you, I've, we've learned the hard way, get those extended service agreements, but also get the roadside assistance that goes with it. Okay. Mr. Cooper, great job. Thank you for sharing this information with us today. And we are so excited that you're taking the time to go through this little mini course to help you understand more about how to go about buying that RV correctly. Please take some time to check us out and check out our facility in Athens, Texas, and our national RV Training Academy, the NRVTA, can be found at www.nrvta.com. So check us out and we'll look forward to seeing you in the final segment of the five things you need to know before you buy an RV. Thank you.